Hi, this is Dark Eudaimonia with a response to Veritas 48, or NOAA. Um, actually, great video with the Kalam cosmological argument. I can honestly say that you actually do a better job of explaining these ideas than Dr. Craig does. Um, especially liked the point about not being able to get through an infinite series of past events to actually get to the present. I can quite honestly say, again, that I never fully understood that point when Dr. Craig would explain it, or even when Leibniz would explain it, but I did understand what you were getting at, and that's something to be proud of. The ability to communicate is something very important, obviously, especially in forums like these. Um, more than anything, it gave me an opportunity to see things from a Christian perspective, or I suppose a theistic perspective. Again, to be honest, the argument never really held any sway for me, and it really still doesn't. Uh, but at least I was given the opportunity to see things from a different perspective, and that's always great. My main problems are with premise three. It's really actually the linchpin of everything. Um, I suppose if all of your other premises are true, then still all of the heavy lifting with regards to God is being done by premise three. That is, the idea that the cause has to be an agent. Um, now, the idea that material minds can exist at all is, to me, impossible. It's basically a, a really bad idea. And I think there's no actual metaphysical difference between agent causation and what you deem efficient causation. All decisions, indeed all thoughts, seem to be the products of our physical minds. And simply because we cannot pin down a particular neuron uh, does not mean that they do not exist as physical phenomena. To understand this, I want you to think of the flight pattern of an airplane. It is determined, or I suppose caused, by its center of gravity. The center of gravity obviously exists and is a physical thing. The center of gravity is in turn caused by the position of each individual part in the airplane. But then the position of the parts are determined by the flight path, which again is determined by the center of gravity. In this way, we mentally break down the world into pieces and what I would call frames, then attach the word causation to one part of it in order to make sense of a much more nuanced and complicated world. For example, think of a theater. You and I, Noah, go to a movie theater with a friend, and this friend, in the middle of the movie, stands up and walks out of the aisle. Now you turn to me and say, what made him leave? And if I responded to you by saying, well, Noah, he left because the neurons in his brain caused synapses to fire along a neurological route to his muscles, causing his muscles to contract and his weight to shift in such a way that the rest of his body moved in concert outside of the theater. If I were to give you that as a response, I don't think you'd be very impressed. You wanted an explanation at the level of thoughts of intentions. Now, I don't think there's actually a metaphysical difference between these two things. I think it's purely a level of explanation, one of what Daniel Dennett would term stances. I also wonder about causation for non-material objects. Now, Dennett calls this the Casper the Friendly Ghost problem. Ghosts are really funny, actually. I don't think we've ever taken the time to think about them. Ghosts seem to be able to go through walls in one frame, but then in the next frame they're picking things up or walking on the ground and doing all sorts of weird things. How do non-physical things interact with physical things? As for timeless, I think Das American Atheist had you on that one, and I hope you do reply to that question. But let me put in my own piece, just for fun. In the last part of explaining the causation piece, 
you claim that nothing preceded your intention to move your hand. I beg to differ. In fact, I find it quite funny that you framed things in this way. Because experiments done in neuroscience on exactly that issue seem to suggest otherwise. Please take a look. We all have this very strong belief that we have conscious free will. And it's a central part of our idea of ourselves as individuals that we can want to do something, we can have an intention to do something, and then we can do it. We can make our intention drive our actions. And Benjamin Libet's work was one of the few experiments which made a, a truly innovative and courageous attempt to address that question. I can't feel it being cold. Patrick Haggard's team are going to measure my brain activity in the run-up to a conscious decision, with electrodes placed on my scalp. OK, Susan, you're hi, all... Hi. Hello. You're all wired up and ready to go. Absolutely. We're going to record okay. from your left motor cortex, mm -hmm. your right motor cortex, and from the midline. Mm -hmm. I want you to watch the clock hand, which mm -hmm. is rotating in this small clock in the centre of the screen. Mm -hmm. And then, at any time that you choose, when you intend mm -hmm. and will to, mm -hmm. I want you to press either this key or this key. As, as, as the urge. As the urge takes you. Fine, OK. And then the computer will prompt you to type in the position of the clock hand at which you first felt the conscious will Fine. to press the button. Good. Any questions? No. Off we go. It's very funny waiting for the urge, isn't it? So watching the clock, I record the exact time that I make the decision to act, while the electrodes on my head monitor the activity in my brain leading up to this decision. As I do this over and over again, a clear pattern starts to emerge. So here are our results which contain the same basic effect as Libet originally found. The average time of the intention to move was where this arrow is here. And you can see that the motor areas of the brain have begun to build up electrical activity in preparation for this willed action 2,000 milliseconds at least before the action actually occurs. Just as in Libet's original work, this experiment seems to show that my brain begins to prepare for movement long before I felt like I had consciously decided to move. 